Good evening. My name is Alice Greenwald. I'm the president and CEO of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. And it is my absolute honor this evening to welcome you to tonight's program, which represents the final offering of our 2016-2017 program season. It has been a remarkable season, as I'm sure many of you are aware, with a breadth and diversity of programs that included baseball Hall of Famer Joe Torrey, CIA Director John Brennan, you don't usually get those two names in the same sentence, the showrunners Alec Gansa and Howard Gordon of Showtime's acclaimed series Homeland, along with its star Mandy Patinkin, the performance of a short opera based on Don DeLillo's Falling Man, with commentary from both the composer and Mr. DeLillo, and a moving and emotional dance performance by the Scottish company Shaper Caper of Within This Dust, inspired by photographs taken on 9-11. And that just skims the surface of what we have offered this season. I can hardly imagine what next season will have in store for us. I hope you will all sign up for our mailing list to stay informed as our calendar is finalized over the next several weeks. Uh, you can also check our social media channels for updates. And we invite you, as always, to share your experiences here tonight uh, using the hashtag 911MuseumTalk. I want to offer a special welcome to our museum members with us this evening, especially those of you who have attended all of these programs this year. Um, our public programs would not be possible without your sustained support. And I do want to call out our um, board member and the co-chair of our education committee, Andrew Senchak, who's with us this evening. Um, Andy has provided tremendous leadership in ensuring the high level of quality of our educational programming. So uh, tonight, befitting the culmination of a substantive and thought-provoking program season, we are particularly privileged to host Drew Gilpin Faust, the 28th president of Harvard University and the Lincoln Professor of History in Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Faust has worked tirelessly to expand financial aid and to improve access to Harvard College for students of all economic backgrounds, as well as to broaden the university's international reach. She has worked to raise the profile of arts on campus, embrace sustainability, and launch edX, an online learning partnership with MIT. Prior to working at Harvard, Professor Faust was the founding dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard, and she served as the Annenberg Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania. A historian of the Civil War and the American South, she has authored six books, the latest of which, This Republic of Suffering, Death and the American Civil War, won the Bancroft Prize in 2009, and was a finalist for both a National Book Award and a Pulitzer Prize. This work explores how the scale of loss in the Civil War, 600,000 killed, fundamentally changed Americans both personally and collectively. This shift will be used as a jumping off point to discuss parallels with 9-11 and the collective grieving process that engulfed this city and our nation in the aftermath of the attacks. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Faust and our EVP and Deputy Director for Museum Programs, Clifford Shannon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Dr. Faust. Um, let me just add, I had um, first read Republic of Suffering. It was in a relatively early stage in my time here, and put it aside and had the experience of as sharing with Alice and Jan and Michael in the back and others who are here, I see Ian, um, of putting the concepts and the place together and now revisiting it. And we just toured the museum and we talked a little bit about this. There are sort of just remarkable consistencies and themes that spread, I think, from the Civil War forward. But that's really where I want to start because the point you make here at the early stages of your argument in the book is that this idea of mass death was unknown to America at that point. And you talk about the scale difference between what the Revolutionary War required of Americans and then 70 or so years later, what the Civil War would require 
unexpectedly by those who entered it, of Americans. And I wonder if you could give us that contrast, what an early initial sense of war was and how that was transformed by the impact of the mass death of the Civil War. It's, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's really wonderful to see this museum and to be able to think about some of these themes in, in this context. One of the aspects, actually, about history is that it is never um, still, it's never settled. And in the time since I wrote this book, when the estimate of death was 620,000, there's been some additional demographic work that has led professional demographers to estimate that it's as much as 750,000. And similarly, there have been escalations in estimates about the death toll and the violence of the American Revolution. So these are changing estimates, but nevertheless, a, a sense in the revolution of a much smaller impact, even in proportion to the size of the population at that time, than what this would have meant in what Civil War death would have meant in mid 19th century America. One of the ways for me to think about this most tangibly, I think, is to, to figure out what would it mean in terms of death today? How many people would be the equivalent in our 21st century population? The higher estimate, 750,000, amounts to about 2.5% of the US population at that time. Today, that would mean 7 million people. So imagine the impact of seven million, a war that killed 7 million people. We have um, the Vietnam War, which had such an impact on our culture, fewer than 60,000 individuals. So just to get a sense of, of the scale. In the revolution, it's unclear that the number of deaths. The record keeping was even less developed. Um, so some have estimated as many as 30 or 40,000, but we're really not sure. Uh, even uh, if we look at the Mexican War, um, the deaths in that war just a few years before the Civil War were far smaller. Um, some have estimated 8,000, 6 to 8,000 deaths perhaps in the, in the Mexican War. So the number 750,000 just stands out so dramatically in comparison with those. And as you describe it, the society itself was surprised and shocked by what was mm -hmm. happening to it, by what it had been caught up in when the coils of war, so to speak, mm -hmm. grasped onto everyone and just ground and ground and ground unceasingly. There was much conversation in the run-up to war that, oh, there'll be perhaps one battle, and then it'll be over with. Everyone will give up and go home. And no one expected the kind of scale of war that the new industrialized um, production of weaponry and railroads so you could resupply and all of the new technology made possible. And I think people didn't expect the political force of a war that could rouse a populace to keep on fighting and to unite the, the power of nationalism and ideology with the power of warfare and therefore keep individuals willing to fight. And so there were politicians who before the war said with great confidence, oh, you know, I'll drink all the blood that gets shed in this war, expecting not to have to do anything. And another politician saying, oh, the, there won't be more than a thimble full of blood. So one of the aspects of this was the really unexpected scale and duration and the possibility for killing that was unleashed by a new industrialized form of warfare. If you can summarize it, what was the impact of all of this on American society coming out of the war? And obviously, there's the North and the South. There's the slave population that is freed. Can you, can you crystallize this for us in some way? The impact of the Civil War? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that's more than a life work. But I mean specifically in terms of the social awareness of what death was and how it had changed the society itself. Well, there are many dimensions of this. One of the ones that I have contemplated a lot, but not I don't think anyone's fully explored the impact of, is the numbers of dead who, numbers of individuals who were bereaved. And this museum and consideration of 9-11 puts a lot of focus on those who were never identified. 
in the Civil War, probably around 50% of those 750,000 were missing and were never returned or identified. So when I think about late 19th century America, it was a nation of mourners. What did that mean for such a sizable part of the population? So that is one of the aspects of the war that I think we should think about as we look at the late 19th century and the history of the late 19th century, but that's never been fully worked out. Another part, though, that I think we can be more specific about is that in the course of the war, there was a growing recognition that the complete disorganization surrounding military death had to be addressed. At the beginning of the war, there were no, soldiers did not carry identification badges of any kind. There were no regular burial units. There was no sense on the part of the government of an obligation to notify next of kin. You would find out that a loved one had been killed um, if a, comrade of that loved one or perhaps a chaplain or an officer saw fit to write to that next of kin. So it was very unspecified, um, very disorganized, and kind of random. And increasingly, people recognized the inhumaneness of this. And also, as this war for a nation, for the preservation of the last best hope of Earth, the democracy of the United States, was fought, people began to think citizens who sacrifice their lives on behalf of the nation have the right to be treated in death with the dignity of citizens. And so the very ideology for which the war was fought contributed to the development of a set of processes and, and responsibilities that the government took up in the creation of the national cemetery system. So the United States' national cemetery system comes out of that Civil War experience and that sense of loss, a recognition that those who die in the nation's service have a right to be treated respectfully in death and have a right to have their remains identified and returned to families. That kind of begins to be articulated in the course of the Civil War and grows out of that Civil War experience. You know, you write that going into the war, there was this generalized mm -hmm. ideal of the good death, that there was this notion of the art of dying, that there mm -hmm. were ways in the bosom of your family, gently going, and so on and so forth, that everyone aspired to if you couldn't mm -hmm. uh, meet. But nonetheless, people shared this conception of what mm -hmm. a good death would be. And then the Civil War comes, and given the number of unidentified and missing and the horrible mangling that was done, and the distances of death mm -hmm. from family. That whole idea, that stability of what you were aspiring to, that's taken away. And so we come to this moment of this sense of loss and missingness in the, the impossibility of returning the fallen soldier to his loved ones. We would echo this, of course, here at Ground Zero with the World Trade Center attacks. But I want to focus in on this initial recognition of the importance of it, because you've already tied it to notions of citizenship and people making a sacrifice on behalf of a cause. But talk to us a little more about that shock of recognition and the kinds of responses it mobilized so quickly. Well, the notion of death in what was really a Victorian society in the mid-19th century had evolved since um, many centuries before, kind of out of a Christian sense of death being a signal event that could give some hint of what an individual's experience in the afterlife might be. And so people sought signs that this, and this is a very Christian nation at this, overwhelmingly Christian nation at this point in its history. And so people sort of sought, all right, was this person a believer? Did this person express confidence in, about an afterlife and about a willingness to die. So last words were very important because they might be predictors of whether this individual would have life everlasting and whether that individual would be, reckon, would be reunited with family members when they died at a later date. So great scrutiny of the nature of a death. And death was seen as something that uh, involve family, they should surround the bedside, it should absolutely happen at home. And the words of the last, the last words of the 
dying individual would be indicative of that individual's life to come. So the first thing that war does is it has people dying away from home. They're dying on battlefields. They're dying in hospitals, military hospitals adjacent to battlefields. And so that this whole family um, aspect of the good death is disrupted. What about last words? Well, of course, unless you heard from someone who was in the unit of the deceased loved one or perhaps a nurse in a hospital, you didn't have that. Now, some of you may, uh, especially being New Yorkers, especially in lower Manhattan, uh, know a good bit about Walt Whitman. And you may know that he attended the death, the sick and dying in Civil War hospitals. He was a hospital visitor. And one of the things he did was record last moments and write to families. And part of the reason for that was he could reassure them in some ways about what their loved ones had said at the last moments of their lives, whether they had died peacefully in um, harmony with their creator's indication that, that they were to be seized up. And so that, that was a critical part of trying to recreate the conditions of a good death at home in very much changed circumstances. And so from the Civil War forward, you also refer at various points in the book to the even larger mass slaughter of World War I, these ever and ever larger costs to not just our society, but to societies undergoing this, take us further and further away from this notion of a good death that can be rationalized in terms of what we believe would be a reward after that. Mm -hmm. that we're no longer connected to something that seems a very important tenet of what had come before. I had an occasion to um, do a little work on World War I and to give a lecture in England comparing some of the aspects of World War I to the Civil War. And one of the things I found so striking is that the number of deaths in Britain in World War I is almost the same as the number of estimated Civil War deaths. It's about 722,000. It's a slightly uh, larger portion of the uh, American population than it was of the British population at that time. But you can see many similar responses. When World War I comes to Britain, that is when Britain establishes its national cemetery system and its processing of the kind of loss and grief that that mass slaughter means. So it's, it seemed almost to me as if there is a, a kind of human demand for in a modern era where we value human life in a certain context for this sort of assurance that the nation state is going to compensate for the disruption of family and human ties that modern warfare represents. You refer to the Gettysburg Address uh, in the book and Lincoln's sort of statement of this essentially new compact uh, with the citizenry who mm -hmm. has sacrificed itself on behalf of this war. And um, you quote uh, Gary Wills uh, saying, the ceremony and the address that historian Gary Wills has argued remade America signaled the beginning of a new significance for the dead in public life. But the dead as having sacrificed on behalf of our common purpose. Mm -hmm. um, is that where we see this really formally for the first time in American history? And do you see it carrying forward all the way to the present day? Gary Wills has written a marvelous, marvelous book about Lincoln at Gettysburg. And his argument in this book is that this is the moment when the meaningless of slaughter is given a precise definition by the nation's leader and is claimed by the nation to be meaningful and important. And he, as he says, they shall not have died in vain. He defines a purpose, which is to dedicate this nation to a new birth of freedom. And so he ties these lives and makes to a national purpose and makes them sacred in service of something larger than any individual and identified with a national purpose that is in some ways larger than any definition of national purpose that has preceded Lincoln's words. And so it's both an elevation of the individuals, 
and an elevation of the nation to say it has these extraordinary purposes, which it must embrace in a new birth of freedom. It's quite an amazing speech. You know, every time I read it, I see something new in it and think about it with more astonishment. So how do we understand? I think one of the biggest purposes of responding to death, the various ways we do it as human beings in various contexts, whether it's through rituals, through words like that, through how we handle bodies or how we build memorials, we want to understand there is a meaning in human life something that makes us different from just animals who experience the end of, of existence. Instead, we want to say there are things that are distinctively human that are about love and companionship and community and na nations that can represent values in the world. And we, we incorporate the deaths into an affirmation of what lives mean and what lives should mean going forward. Some of us will remember that um, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, there was this set of ceremonies. And Governor Pataki, who it turns out is a real Lincoln buff and a student of the Civil War, uh, he wound up one of these ceremonies. He wound up reading the Gettysburg mm -hmm. Address. And it, I had taken a tour of Gettysburg where it was referred to. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. at Gettysburg, it made a very different kind of sense to me than it had previously. Because as you say, it's evoking something that began in that sacrifice, but could be extended forward even up until the deaths of 9-11. Mm -hmm. Is that Gettysburg Address, is there a through line from that through the other sacrifices of our other wars and losses in a common purpose that comes and brings us to 9-11? Well, there are similarities and contrasts, obviously, between Gettysburg and, and what happened here. This, these were not individuals who knew they were at war when they went off to work or to school or whatever they might have been doing on the morning of 9-11. So they had not self-consciously said, I am fighting on behalf of the nation, and I am ready to give this sacrifice. Rather, they were claimed unwittingly, unknowingly. They might have been willing to die for their country. We don't know, but they hadn't been asked to. So the unexpectedness of this, I think, is a powerful element in the 9-11 um, experience. Nevertheless, they take on a meaning for our nation about community. They require from all of us an affirmation of kind of transcendence of tragedy through our community and our respect for them that is very much like what I think um, Lincoln was trying to establish and what came out of his experience at Gettysburg. I just had um, something, you, you probably don't know this, but it, it is relevant, so I, I want to bring it up. I was just in Vietnam in March, and I'd never been there before, and I'd always wanted to go because I am a child of this, you know, I was in college in the 60s, those words resonate, you know, Dien Bien Phu or um, Hanoi or Hue or Apak, those words resonate in my mind and always have, and I wanted to see those places. And one of the things I found extraordinary is that Vietnam is struggling with these memories of war and how to think about the three million Vietnamese that died in what they call the American War and how to reconcile North and South in an eerie kind of resonance with our own issues of North and South and how you make a human life, make sure a human life has meaning and is respected and honored for having meaning even when that human life has been obliterated. So I found, I gave a talk kind of comparing some of the memorial issues and the nationalism issues of the Civil War and the Vietnamese dealing with what they call the American War. So I've been thinking about that set of memorial um, challenges as well. We here um, have, over the years, even before mm -hmm. our opening, received visitors from many places that have suffered a loss, the Norwegian tragedy, mm -hmm. the terrorist attack there. Just today, uh, we met with some people who are involved in efforts to build a Korean memorial for the ferry sinking. So it's not even an mm -hmm. act of war, but mm -hmm. it is a mass mm -hmm. death. And 
you have seen this across a very large scale. Out here, we have this massive memorial, which is a very formal place that gives us a shape and a ritual for this. Is this something that is now a common expectation for the aftermath of a mass death, do you think? Well, one of the aspects that I find so powerful looking at this and that I think is part of human need is we want a physicality to try to capture something that is ineffable. What is death? It's so hard to say. It's an absence. We want a presence to represent that absence. So we want, at a funeral, a body. If we don't have a body, we struggle, I think, to replace that with some other kind of representation of a body that can enable us to turn the ideas into a reality of physicality, even if it's not, in a sense, it can't replace the absent one, but to stand in for, to represent that absent one. And so the combination of absence and presence in this memorial, the, the hole, the, and yet the walls that you were showing me, the <clears throat> remains of the pillars, that's not what they're called, they're not called pillars. The box column. The, yeah. Um, remind us of what is and what isn't, and the relationship between what is and what isn't. And I think that's an essential part of human mourning and of the transition that humans have to go through in mourning from just over, being overwhelmed with grief to somehow incorporating that into our lives as we continue to live them. So much of what you describe in this uh, book is about simply the human response to being overwhelmed by this mass horrible tragedy. Mm -hmm. It's not even a good death. It's just the worst mm -hmm. death imaginable in many cases. And so many of those things recur in the 9-11 story, the missing people, the, the emphasis on the naming of the dead and how many of the issues that were so difficult touch on these kinds of things. The expectation that the government would have a role to play, whether it's mm -hmm. in adjudicating disputes or providing recompense of some kind, these all, it seems, go back to those initial shocks of the Civil mm -hmm. War and the effort to try to do something to make it right. Mm -hmm. This idea of the government or, or survivors, I'm not sure whom, that's maybe part of the question, of trying to make order out of this remarkably disordered situation, mm -hmm. that also seems to be something that the Civil War and those who survived it had to grapple with for the first time on that kind of a scale, and then projected their solutions, if you will, forward mm -hmm. 150 mm -hmm. plus mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. later into our own history and elsewhere around the world. Yeah, I think so many of the assumptions and approaches that are characteristic of the 9-11 tragedy have their roots in responsibilities that were undertaken by the government. The idea the government had a responsibility that the public had a responsibility. That clearly is very powerful in the response to 9-11. That would have been bewildering before the Civil War. Mm. That was something that really came to be accepted during the Civil War period. I think also the, the notion of naming, that's almost equivalent to what I was just saying about physical reality. A name lives on, a name identifies a person with something you can see and you can touch. People go to the Vietnam Memorial all the time and touch and do rubbings, and maybe here people too. are doing rubbings here too. Here too. It's a, a something you can hold on to that says, this person lived, this person's life was meaningful, this person's life is now a memory that I can hold on to. So that again is something that really comes out of the kind of democratization of acknowledgement of death of the Civil War period. The, there is one monument to the Mexican War dead. It's in Mexico City. It was not erected until five years after the war ended. There, they collected about 750 bodies and not one is named. Mm -hmm. That's after a war that was 1846 to 1848. By 1866, you have um, 
federal troops in the aftermath of war being sent all over the American South to byways and highways and apple orchards to try to find every single Union soldier who had been buried anywhere in the South. What a difference in such a short period of time. And those expeditions discovered and reburied 303,000 soldiers in national cemeteries. So there's like a complete mind transformation. And you can see that spirit here in the dedication to recovering the missing that goes on in hopes of new DNA capacity that will enable us to continue to identify remains into the foreseeable future. So you see this commitment really coming forward. And I, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, is it the society itself, the government, or is this an understanding that society and government share that some aspect of citizenship is the preservation or the respect for the dead who might otherwise lose their identity if actions are not taken to preserve them? Who does this? Where does it come from, the impetus for this? Well, I would say that it is a, I mean, government and the people, you can't separate them entirely. There's obviously um, a dialogue. There are individuals who are beseeching the government to do this and lobbying for certain kinds of legislation. But um, I'll tell you a, a story about one individual in particular who had a huge impact um, on the movement to identify and recover the dead in uh, in this effort that I, I just described. And I have a funny story about how I did research on this individual, because I first discovered him when I was in the National Archives looking at the records of the cemetery system. And I found this little set of diaries that had been written by a Union soldier named Edmund Whitman, who had led one unit of these um, troops that were trying to look for bodies all over the South. So I thought, let me find out a little bit more about Edmund Whitman. And I found that he had also very actively lobbied and tried to make the case with the government, had met with members of Congress about the need to take care of and recover Union bodies in the South. And he argued in, in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War that this had to happen because the bodies were being desecrated. There were some Southerners who were so angry about the outcome of the war that they were damaging these bodies um, purposefully. And then he said, with spring plowing in the spring of 1866, they're just going to be turfed up when they've been buried on farms and so forth. So he made the case. And uh, the quartermaster general, he, Edmund Whitman had been a quartermaster during the Civil War. Quartermaster General Montgomery Meggs, who's kind of in charge of military burials, authorizes him to do it. And the federal government author passes a law. So he and others, many others, start scouring the South to find these bodies. I wanted to know what motivated Whitman so strongly to do this. So I backed up a bit, and I found that before the war, he had been an active abolitionist and had felt so strongly about human rights of enslaved individuals that he had been a real um, proponent of anti-slavery positions and of kind of the sacredness of every human life. And he felt that that had to be extended into death and that people who had fought on behalf of freeing slaves particularly should be honored for their own dedication to human rights. And so that whole spirit is a kind of interesting one. But then I found out, and this really, I promise you, I found out after I knew all these other things. Turned out this guy had gone to Harvard. <laughs> Good <He> reason. Was, <laughs> he was a, uh, a school teacher. He'd gone to Harvard quite late in life. He was. Um, in his late 20s by the time he graduated. By the time he fought in the Civil War as a quartermaster, or was in the Civil War as a quartermaster, he was in his late 40s and early 50s. So he was a, a very dedicated anti-slavery person. And, and he saw that line in his own life leading directly from caring about the human condition to caring about the rights of the dead. And the rights of the dead and their connection to citizenship and the rights that a citizen have that doesn't just pertain to the dead. It's the dead who somehow extend them to the rest of us because of the compact that is entered into by giving them the mm -hmm. rituals and mm -hmm. the recognition mm -hmm. that they can no longer mm -hmm. claim for themselves. One of the aspects of 
the Civil War's changing attitudes towards the dead is the sense on the part of the living that we, if we don't treat the dead with respect, we lessen our own humanity. That in the way we treat the dead, we define what it means to be human. So we're not just saying something about the dead. We're saying something very important about the living and about what it means to have the values that matter to us as human beings. And so there's a, there is a kind of exchange of respect that in treating the dead with respect, you earn respect for the condition of being human and therefore for yourself. I would say that that is almost a direct description of so much of what happened here uh, in relation to the victims of 9-11, the rituals that were evolved here at the site during the cleanup period for the recovery and removal of remains. Mm -hmm. um, it's an extension of citizenship in some way. It's an extension of human identity. But it does seem to me that this idea that civilians also could fall in a war, even if they mm -hmm. didn't know the war was being waged against them, that that too ties us back mm -hmm to the impact of the Civil War on this culture. And another aspect is that in the Civil War, there was a departure from the normal modes of dying and death, as we discussed, away from home, et cetera, et cetera. And so humans had to invent new rituals, new ways of dealing with things, rituals of burial on the battlefield by individuals who'd never thought of themselves as priests or, or ministers or people who would preside over, over such rituals, um, things people did in hospitals, just making up for the absence of what had been the way of dealing with the dead. And of course, there's so many invented traditions here. The, the pole with people's names on the it and, the, call, and yeah. the memorialization process that came out of the missing posters. Those started as missing posters. They ended up as memorial posters. So when you have a new kind of death, a new set of circumstances of death, a new scale of death, it requires humans to invent new ways of coping with death and defining what life is and what death is in face of those changed circumstances. One of the things that uh, you describe in the book is the impact of state-of-the-art technology on people's awareness of what the war was. And in the case of the Civil War, it's photography, and Matthew Brady being perhaps mm -hmm. the most famous of those photographers, but so many of them who were out in the field. And these photographs, whether being printed in newspapers or circulating, bring an entirely new awareness of what's happening to people into their homes. Mm -hmm. You know, the analogy for that is the live transmission of the attack on the World Trade Center, not just the immediacy of New Yorkers, but the immediacy of people around the world watching mm -hmm. this. The second plane hit, and then the ultimate collapse of those two towers. And it's extraordinarily striking to me that parallel between the Civil War impact of photography and the 9-11 impact of live broadcast of what turned out to be this mm -hmm. cataclysmic mm -hmm. historical event. There's an exhibit of Matthew Brady's photography here in New York that takes place after the uh, Battle of Antietam, and the New York Times editorializes and says, it's as if someone had come and dumped dead bodies on the street. There's a vividness here, a closeness to this reality of death that we have never experienced before because no one had seen photographs of that sort. Let me insert an intermediate chapter into this story, which is World War I and the experience uh, in Britain that I came upon when I was writing this uh, comparative essay. In World War I Britain, the medium is film, which is pretty new in uh, 1916. And the British government sends off a propaganda crew before the Battle of the Somme to record what they anticipate will be a glorious victory. And so you they do this film, and of course it isn't a glorious victory. It's one of the most tragic days in all of warfare. 60,000 people um, killed in, in the initial days of the Somme. And so there is this film that they have, and they decide they're going to show it anyway. So they show it in Britain. Half the British population watches it because it appears in theaters all over the country. 
And it starts with people waving and going off to the battlefield and looking all cheerful. And then you have these gruesome scenes of injury and, and death. And the British population responds, now I understand war in a way I never had. So I think it's, as the new technologies come, there's a new directness of feeling that one has in response to a new technology. Because you've just never had the opportunity to see quite that way before. And so I think we can almost see a spectrum of, I don't know what the next technology will be, but we can see that development. It, and as you were talking about technologies, can I add another please. part of this? I think they're also changing technologies in how we are able to treat the dead. Embalming is something that is um, coming into to being just before the Civil War, and it enabled some more privilege. It was very expensive, but there were some bodies that would be embalmed. People would come and, and pay money to have their loved ones embalmed and sent home. And as we see DNA, um, development of DNA, we're able to identify more and to know more and to be reunited with individuals that would have been taken from us entirely. So there's a whole technology, I think, of, of death in that sense. Absolutely. Too. I just want to come back to the yep. visual technology aspect because you know, the aspect that we now all suffer from is the abuse is not quite the right word, but the transformation of that technology into propaganda tool by the ISIS's of the world. So yep. what would be so vivid and horrible for some is for them a way of promoting themselves. Is there, are there any equivalents of that, sort of the abuse of the dead in these earlier episodes, whether the Civil War or World War I that you might know? You can think of Holocaust, survive, uh, Holocaust films of the victims in the camps, not as the, the images to be abused, but they're so horrible that it may be some way somewhat abusive of the audience in a certain sense. But the things we see today are very deliberately celebrating the things that most of us find entirely revolting. That's interesting. I can't think of celebrations. Um, of, I, I can't think of quite the equivalent there. I'll have to muse on that because some more. You do quote uh, from various, whether it's northern or southern fighters, celebrating the deaths of their opponents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not everybody, that was mm -hmm. not universal, mm -hmm. but there is some of that, but that's not quite the same thing. Yeah, I think it's more in the heat of battle, the kind of gruesome, glory-filled sense that you have been victorious or you have foiled the enemy. Now, there are many currents running through your account of motivations and responses, whether it's becoming more religious or less religious or more dedicated to the cause or simply throwing up your hands and saying this inhumanity is impossible to sustain, all of this. But one of the things that's particularly interesting to me is this idea that sort of the modern disillusion with the world as we know it, because the scale of death is just too great to sustain, you find that first appearing in the context of the Civil War and you link it to what we would then identify as the main current of response to World War I this notion mm. that the modern world mm -hmm. simply is going to devour itself. It, doesn't, it has the technology, but not the understanding mm -hmm. to manage this. So take us back to this idea that this modern sense of disillusionment uh, comes out of the Civil War context. I see little hints of what I would say is uh, attributed more often to a First World War consciousness, the kind of disillusion that if any of you are familiar with Paul Fussell's writings that he attributes to World War I. But it, it appears intermittently and only among some writers who I think are projecting into a future that takes this up more robustly. One of those writers is Ambrose Bierce, who writes with, he was a participant in the war himself. He served with great honor in the Union Army. He was seriously wounded, fought throughout the war, and then became a journalist and wrote with a kind of 20th century irony and um, uh, nihilism almost hmm. about what humans well, he would sort of mock them for their own self-interest. He would um, mock death. He would define away the ideals of the war in, in essays and short stories 
the uh, what is it the incident at Alt Bridge, kind of fooling his audience, trying to undermine the very foundations of belief, and particularly anti-religious in its implications. And so I see a very modern sensibility there, less uh, mocking, less iconoclastic in this direct way. Herman Melville, the author of Moby Dick, wrote a series of poems about the war that emphasized the, the kind of industrialization of destruction and how that undermines the humane values of civilization, but also undermines the infatuation with glory that he felt had motivated much of the war. And then perhaps most interesting in this regard, I see Emily Dickinson, who has not traditionally been thought of as a Civil War poet, but wrote a substantial portion of her oeuvre during the Civil War while she was living in Amherst, Massachusetts, and while she saw many sons of Amherst go off and die. So the, the war was very much a presence in her life, even though she was seen as sort of isolated. She's always been seen as removed from any society or experience. She was very aware of childhood friends who were killed. They, the, her family got many newspapers every day. And if you look at her work, a lot of the imagery is um, the glory lasted till the guns, if some of you know, know that one. And she just talks about the um, undermining of the, the kind of glorification of warfare, of the ambitions of victory, the reality of defeat and destruction, and of course her central theme of her poetry throughout is death. And I think that's in no small part due to having lived through this very destructive period. So people questioning, is heroism to be valued? Is glory something we seek? Is war a glorious and romantic undertaking? And these writers are beginning to ask questions about the purposes of this, about the motivations of humans, about um, the idealism that had fueled the origins of civil war, and I think the origins of so many wars. Take us to the latter part of the 19th century and then forward, where these expectations of government are now entrenched, and the government is acting on behalf of this regularization of rituals of death in relation to the military. But also, at a certain point, and David Blight has written about this, it, it sort of combines the two narratives of North and South into this kind of celebration of sacrifice, leaving the actual issues of the Civil War behind uh, for reasons that may be more or less suspect. But I'd like mm -hmm. to hear you talk about mm -hmm. that. Well, the reunion of the nation and the, the kind of mitigation of the ongoing hostilities between North and South towards the end of the 19th century came about because of a sense of shared sacrifice and a sense that and you, you see representations of this today. You know, the Confederacy suffered and experienced losses, and Confederate soldiers were um, brave and courageous, and therefore brothers of Union soldiers who were also brave and courageous, and that the white America could reunite around this, as it, indeed it did. If any of you saw the Ken Burns series about the Civil War, many decades ago now, it came out in the early 90s, there is footage in that of the 50th reunion of those who fought at Gettysburg. And you have Northerners and Southerners all embracing, and you know now we, we are back together again. But this came at tremendous sacrifice of the emancipationist legacy of the war, because this is when the United States more or less abandoned its commitment to truly transforming the nature of race relations in the United States. And the era of Jim Crow emerges with great vehemence and violence in the 1890s. And the suppression of black America is something that North and South join hands in um, instituting in, in the late 19th century. This is when Plessy v. Ferguson makes segregation legal and fundamental. It's um, kind of a foundation of the deprivation of black rights that persists until the civil rights era of post-World War II and the civil rights movement of the 1960s. So North and South ironically come to agree on 
a shared narrative of loss and sacrifice that excludes black Americans from a narrative that also enables their, their continuing oppression for another 100 years. Which brings us, in some sense, to the present day and the mm -hmm. debates about the removal of Confederate memorials just in New Orleans and other places, the disputes about the Confederate flag and its place in a public venue in various southern states. Can you talk to us about that in relation to these many things we've discussed so far this evening? Well, in a sense, all of the things we're talking about are how do we understand history and how do we bring history into relationship with the present and use history, in a sense, as a foundation for a better world and for informing ourselves to not simply repeat the errors of the past and to move beyond the errors of the past. The issue of Confederate history is such a complex one. And the Confederate flag, one of the issues about the Confederate flag is that no one really cared about the Confederate flag for numbers of years until it was brought back into use as uh, a symbol of opposition to civil rights in the 1960s. So that is so clearly associated with a movement of, of racist opposition to change and equality, that it has been seen as a direct representation of a set of values that I think is highly offensive to African Americans and to those who understand its relationship to, to these uses of bigotry. The issue of history and statues and names is one that I think we need to be a little careful about in that we don't want to just simply forget that there was a civil war and that there are those who advocated for racial oppression. We need to remember that. We need to remember that these individuals have not died in vain, as, as um, Lincoln said of the, the Union soldiers. So we want to remember it, but we don't want to honor it. And we need to figure out the ways that we do that. Now, one of the uh, responses of a number of mun municipalities has been to take statues and remove them from places of honor in the center of the town square and say, we're going to put them in a museum instead. I think that is an effort to remember but not honor. I think we also need to understand um, what the relationship of particular individuals to the cause has been. I often worry that we could probably dismantle every statue of every person who ever lived if we're not more specific than we sometimes are about errors of the past. Racism was so widespread. How people felt about women was pretty terrible. So let's be sure that we focus on the individuals who really were responsible for the kinds of extreme actions that we wish to condemn, not individuals who simply lived in a different time and lived along with the values of that time. So how do we understand and make those distinctions? And as these well? issues pop up everywhere. I, yep. I, uh, they come to the university. I yes. will mention the controversy at Yale over Calvin mm -hmm. College. Uh, all universities, mm -hmm. let us say, uh, have to look back at their past. Is this a positive process for an institution to rethink its past this way? All emotion aside, these are difficult things, and there are people on either side of this. But how do you take this in a, in, in a direction which becomes, if not necessarily unifying, a way of actually coming to a new understanding of something? Well, I think in a sense you've answered your question. Is it a positive thing? It depends on how it evolves. At Harvard, we have... I wanted to try, I have wanted, this is an ongoing process, I have wanted to try to make it a positive thing. Now, Harvard is more removed from the center of the history of slavery than, say, Georgetown, which has had this searing confrontation with its own past and with the fact that the um, fathers or the priests at Georgetown in quite late 1830s sold hundreds of slaves that belonged to the university down the river to the cotton fields of Louisiana and the, the swamps of Louisiana in order to pay off a debt. That is a documentable 
and they can trace the families. It's a, a very difficult history that Georgetown has unearthed and spoken about and confronted in a very direct way. Harvard's relationship to history to slavery is somewhat different. New England had, until recently, not been understood to be as involved with slavery as, in fact, it was. Um, slavery existed in Massachusetts until 1783. And after that time, uh, many people in Massachusetts still profited from slavery through investments, uh, through the cotton trade, through a variety of connections of family and business with the South. And so it's not that New England was not connected to slavery. It's just we need to recognize it in a way that New England hasn't and come to terms with it. So one of the things that I have wanted to do is to understand Harvard's relationship better, to sponsor more research on that question, and then to try to understand how we can make the presence of slavery on our campus a part of a history that has not included that up until now. And so one of the things that we have done is to try to name the names. And we found that there were two Harvard presidents that lived in a building that's still on our campus. And while they had lived in the building, they had owned enslaved people who lived with them in the building. And we were able to find the names of four of these individuals. So a little over a year ago, we had a ceremony. And John Lewis, Congressman Lewis, came and participated with us. We put up a plaque with the names of those individuals on the house to say, you know, these were lives. These were human beings who were part of our community. These were stolen lives. Let's remember these individuals and not simple and to begin not with an erasure but with an addition of understanding and of human life to our past so we had a conference that we sponsored on slavery and universities last march this will be a continuing saga as we find out more our law school found that one of its founding donors had been somebody who had really made his money in um, slavery, in slaves he owned in the Caribbean. And so the law school shield, which had been kind of invented in 1936 for Harvard's 300th birthday, had taken, hit, borrowed his family's shield. And the law school said, we don't want this as our shield. So they are celebrating their 200th anniversary this year, and they're going to design a new shield. So which parts of our heritage do we add to by adding names and adding aspects of our past that we hadn't recognized? Which parts of our past do we want to change? And so can we make it a kind of discussion and learning experience for the community as a whole rather than a polarizing moment where some people feel pitted against others? I don't know the extent to which we'll succeed, but I think we've learned a lot together so far. And we've had a sense of some progress and expansion of ourselves through this rather than simply a battle. Stay tuned. So we will. <laughs> Let's see if we um, have a couple of questions from our audience. Um, if you <laughs> just you have to wait for the mic. Someone will come. The erase between Danny and Danny. Yes, OK. Hello, I'm Andy Von Salas. I began to doubt whether your central argument in your book really applies to September 11. Uh, and what made me doubt that is that I'm a docent who shows people, tourists, around the uh, World Trade Center site. And their experience of 9-11 seems to be very different than mine because they weren't in New York at the time. When New York suffered September 11, it didn't feel like it was an act of war. It felt like a huge mass murder, a big crime. And uh, we thought maybe it would be handled the same way as the 1993 truck bombing of the World Trade Center, where you'd go to federal court and convict the people and, and recover from that the way we do with a crime. Um, another difference is that in New York, half the people didn't have broadcast television because the broadcast tower was gone. So. Uh, Many of us never saw what America saw. Uh, so the, the idea of being at war and thereby having a purpose that justifies uh, the mm -hmm. um, cause and that uh, makes the victims uh, noble um, as participants, as, as opposed to just un unwitting people who happen to be 
killed in the crossfire, so, so to speak. Um, it makes me wonder how much of your thesis actually applies to September 11. And I think partly you may have answered it when you just said it depends on whether you died for a cause or not. Well, I would agree with you that there are sharp differences. And I think I, I said these are not individuals who woke up that morning volunteering to defend a nation. They were unwitting victims. But I think that the aftermath of dealing with death, of dealing with mass death, of responding to tragedy, of understanding the community's responsibility to people who, even if they weren't volunteers, were nevertheless killed because they were part of this country or they were in this country, in a certain place in this country that was symbolic of, of the country in the eyes of those who killed them. So I think there are parallels. It's not certainly not an exact parallel, but I think there are parallels in, in the human response. And also, there are conditions of death and how we treat death that I believe evolved out of the Civil War period that were a foundation for how the nation responded to these deaths. Let me pick up on this a little bit, because it raised an interesting point. Certainly, as you say, that was a normal morning. People were expected to be in the office. But it turns out that in somebody else's view, what they were doing was either criminal or the extension mm -hmm. of policies that were a war mm -hmm. on someone else. And this was sort of a redefinition in the attack itself of what constituted yep. a justifiable attack, justified in the eyes of Al-Qaeda, not certainly in our eyes. But that is another aspect of this that is going to have to play out over the years. But what becomes the, the war, the basis of an attack or the basis of war? Terrorism is the definition yep. of that. Yep. Uh, but it's also, it, it makes it a bigger moment in a certain sense that what we perceive of as normal, innocent actions mm -hmm. are somehow reinterpreted as worthy of a war. Well, part of the reality of terrorism is it defines everyone as a soldier, doesn't it? Right. Or everyone as a potential enemy combatant. So all of us, willing or not, represent a target or potential target if we're in a certain place and seen to be representative of a society that is defined by terrorists as the enemy. So that that's a shift in our understanding. Now, the Civil War itself, actually, uh, the clear notion of civilians and soldiers begins to break down in a number of locations during the Civil War. There was guerrilla warfare and terrorism in Missouri in Western North Carolina. Um, there were places where civilians who had not, who did not see themselves as combatants were nevertheless treated as if they were. Um, but terrorism just blurs that entirely. The whole point of terrorism is to blur that. Quite deliberately so, yeah. Let's see, um, in the hmm. back, something? Thought I had one. Back there? Yeah. I would also make a distinction that for, there was a large cohort of the first responders and how people mourned and celebrated their actions, the firemen who were lost at 9-11. And that's a separate cohort and how that's mm -hmm. been looked at the last 15 years. Every fire station you pass by, there's a monument at the fire station in remembrance, as opposed to just the people who did come to the office mm -hmm. on an ordinary day. Mm -hmm. right. right. And those were people who chose to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Let me have the pleasure of saying, Mom, would you like to ask a question? <laughs> Hold on, wait for, wait for the mic, wait for the mic. This is great. I really get to order the whole thing here. This is the first time this is happening. Mother? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, my dear. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question about those people in the war, the Civil War, or whose actions, they died in battle, but whose actions were questionable and possibly treasonable, how, if, they, if this came out, if they certainly would know about it, how were these people treated in terms of the memorials in the cemeteries, the American cemeteries, which are most beautiful in, in the foreign countries uh, and in America? How were these people, how, how, did they, how did they assign, or what did they assign to these people? So are you thinking about 
Southerners committing treason by causing the war? Or are you thinking no, no, about no. I mean, act, who, what a treasonable acts that might have been uh, judged. These people might have been judged like traitors, to have been traitors or semi-traitors, or they had, they had some business that when they were on the side of the southern side, that was not was not commendable. Well, one of the aspects of the Civil War and death in the Civil War that is very gruesome is the number of individuals who were executed uh, in military executions for perhaps trying to desert, mm -hmm. for other kinds of activities that were seen in that, violation. That's the question, yes. And those individuals would often simply be you know, cast aside or buried in an unmarked grave. But there was a very ritualized performance of executions in the Civil War. And these were very horrifying to the troops. And soldiers often wrote about them in diaries because they were so awful to see this self-conscious, determined taking of a life of another soldier, having all the soldiers march out in square and witness it was partly meant to keep them, keep other soldiers, terrify other soldiers, so they wouldn't try to do the same thing. And indeed, it did terrify them, because it not only killed someone, it humiliated him in front of all the troops. So those were memorable scenes, and often written about, often illustrated um, in, the, in the Civil War context. Thank you very much. I, last indulgence <laughs> for the end of the season. <laughs> Forgive me, but. That was helpful all the way around. Um, I do want to say it has been a remarkable uh, season of public programs here, capped by this remarkable discussion, which, again, for those of us who have been part of this, and many of the people in this audience have been part of this from 9-11 onward, uh, you talk about things in this book that seem very familiar, that make us understand something about the long flow of American history that we felt an attachment to, but didn't fully understand, I think. And it's very, very beautifully illuminated in your book. So I'd like everyone, please, to join me in thanking Drew Gilpin-Faust, and look forward to seeing you next fall. Thank you.